Well, it's been a really not super good day of fishing, but that is a mighty nine inch smallmouth bass on the mic drop. <laughs> Yo, man, that's really, there we go. What's up? So, you know, my wife's looking at me like you're weird talking to the camera. Man, I had that sweet black and chartreuse one over the white. Got bit off by a pike, like the first five minutes we were here. Switched spots, hooked like three or four smallmouth, they all got off. Today's just not a good day for fishing. So, gonna hand the camera to my wife. I'm gonna show you guys what this looks like in the water. I'm gonna try some more for maybe 10 minutes and then we're gonna quit, because I am devastated. But, this is the first one I ever tied, because I lost my really beautiful chartreuse and black one. But this is the original mic drop with the magic head tail. You're moving way too fast. Sorry, magic head tail. Check it out. Yeah. That looks good. Bo, sit. Sit. It's not a monster, but it's a much better bass than the other one. Oh, he's good. So we have like perfect high and dirty water. Always going to town in the back of that fly. I'm gonna release him. Sweet. What's going on everybody? Gunner here and today we're gonna go over the mic drop which is a pretty slick little bug. It's got a, a Marc Petitjean Magic Head size 3. So they're like PM size 3. Uh, it's the product number from Hairline which is the distributor. And the Magic Head is, is a cone. It's, this, it's a soft plastic cone. I think when people see me put these on this they don't realize that they're soft. But you can actually invert this which is how you thread the shank and I'll show you that. But it's a cone that fills with water pressure and then once it fills it kind of it spills over, right? So you fill this cone full of water pressure and then it spills over and then it overcorrects and overcorrects and overcorrects and it creates a vibration. And the coolest thing to me about this fly, and one of the most important aspects of it is the mass, it, it uses a size large tungsten cone head. Size large tungsten cone head. And that mass, when you jig it or strip it or jerk strip it, it is enough momentum to overcome the drag of the tail. So like the original design, which you can find, I have a Vimeo channel that's like four years old go check it out. I think you have to search for people and search for money, but it'll come up. And there's a fly on there called Shake Your Booty, or Shake the Booty, Shake That Booty, I don't remember, but it's this pattern three and a half years ago or something, and I used to do it with a braid extension, which is actually, um, I forget how it all works, but it has to do with uh, kind of like Danish uh, worm sea trout flies, but they're worm imitations. Um, and they're super cool little bugs, but you use braid, you extend it off the hook, you spin it and it counter wraps itself with a chenille and then you have this braided stinger hook that's free to move. And that's how I used to do it, but they were weightless. And when you have this, this is just, this is like a parachute behind your fly, right? And when you strip that, if your bug's weightless, it'll just stop your fly. <laughs> and so the only movement you get is then when you're pulling your fly. And so then you kind of have to do this constant retrieve thing where you're always trying to move this fly, but with a heavy enough mass on the front hook with that large tungsten cone head, it has enough momentum that it overpowers this tail, so the tail's always kicking. And so what's cool is because it's a jig fly and I run it on a floating line, and I'm not fishing an extreme amount of line, but the, the tail 
the frequency of the tail kicks changes and it slows down at the top and gets bigger at the top. So it's falling, it's falling, you strip it up and then it gets to the top and it slows down and then it falls and then it gets to the top and it slows down and then it falls. It's the coolest thing ever. So we're gonna tie it. This is the mic drop. We're doing it in like a white, a white color. White, tan, overweight, something like that. I'm coming in with 140 Vivas power thread. And I'm gonna build a small little thread dam right here at the hook eye. I'll tell you why in a second. And that's it. So when we push that magic head over, it seats just behind that hook eye um, so that we have enough room to stick our, our uh, shanks in there and stuff like that. So I'm coming with some tailing flash. This is uh, Hairline's Ripple Ice Fiber in pure, uh, pearl green hue. Pretty slick stuff and we're actually going to use this to stack the body on the front. And I don't need a lot. And I'm just going to kind of do like a little short 40 on the back. Do like a 60 on the front. Just get a little uneven length to those fibers. I'm not too worried about it. And then if there's something that's like too long or something I'll just kind of come in and break it. And that's all I'm looking for. Now this tail, if you've followed the mic drop for a little bit on my Instagram, the tail's changed and I've been experimenting with like a ripple ice tail and I did a soft tackle tail at one point and I did a soft tackle uh, kind of material dam over marabou tail. And really the best one was the first one which was just marabou. It just is killer. The two plumes, so we're just gonna palmer two plumes of marabou. And you can see I have this tied in at the base. I actually figurated the base. I'll walk you through that on the next uh, stem here. I'll tell you why I did that. But I'm just going to hackle this marabou forward. Now when I hackle my marabou, to get the best durability out of this, I'm just going to use touching wraps. And the Oh, broke my stem. But I'm going to use touching wraps to walk this forward. And the most important thing is once it's walked forward, I'm going to take my thread all the way back to where I tied it in. So you're going to basically trap down every individual marabou fiber. And that, that way, I mean, the, the whole point is that you don't have an exposed stem. Like, I just broke my stem lightly pulling on it, right, trying to wrap this. Can you imagine if you got a pike tooth in there or walleye tooth or brown trout tooth? Any, any species that has teeth. <laughs> but you just get a tooth in there and you break that stem apart and then your whole tail is basically ruined. So you can see I'm gonna, I got a trapped fiber in there. But I'm gonna wrap this back to where I tied it in. So the entire stem now is covered. This is my tip and I don't really like the way my tips look. But my entire stem from base to tip is covered in thread wraps. So that's like 100% durability good to go -ness. Now I'm, before I, I palmer my next plume I'm gonna come in with a magic head. I trimmed the little tag end here just a little bit short so it's a little bit easier to work with. And I just push that over my hook. And I forgot to mention this is a size 4 A-Rex light stinger hook. And I'm gonna trap that down. You can see how my thread dam just behind the hook eye it kinda helped that seat a little bit farther back so that I can invert this you can see that and get to the hook eye right see what I'm saying now this is where I want my second plume I'm actually gonna wrap all of it on top of that little base for that magic head and I'm just printing my fibers away so I have a little bit of my stem exposed I'm selecting the amount of marabou um, so that if you were to look at an overall plume like you can see this is this used to be connected right my overall plume if you were to take this part of the stem and bend it, it's not very flexible and it tends to break. And if it breaks, obviously it's gonna break at your tie-in point and you're not gonna be able to palmer it. So that's where I select the length of my marabou. And when I figure eight it, because marabou has a compressed stem, I'm controlling the concavity of that feather. So you can see my feather sticks up 90 degrees. This is perpendicular to my shank and it's not gonna rotate when I go to palmer this. And the whole idea behind that is if you can control the concavity and it's not going to rotate, then you can palmer it clockwise because I wrap my thread clockwise. So when I catch it with my thread, I add tension. So my marabou stem is never losing tension in the whole process. It's all just durability stuff. It's just simple, very simple technique.
thingamadoojiggers. But anyway, that magic head with the marabou is super prime. And this marabou tail, you'll see like if you take it out of the water, it slicks back to like nothing. But because that magic head pushes water, it's the marabou tail, it, it has more volume than you think when it's in the water. I broke that off, but I think I can save it. So what I was trying to say before, I just had to focus there for a second. But that marabou, it it fills in all the negative space created by this head. So you, like when you, you take it out and it's all soaked with water and it kind of collapses, it's like super ultra thin. But in the water, it's super bulky and lively and just wispy as all get out. And I'm going to do a little finger whip a ways back from the, the back side of my cone here. The whole point being I want to hit this with a little dab of glue, but I don't really want to get glue on that because it'll kind of get like a chalky coloration to it. So I'm just going to tap basically my knot. You could also put super glue on your thread and just wrap your thread. That, that, would, have been, that would have been smart. It's too late for that. Now this, this fly is basically a game changer. It has a game changer platform. Just two shanks in it though. You can see that jointed shanks, but we have two 20 millimeter shanks. Now the order of the shanks, you could do two fish spines if you wanted to, they're 20 millimeters in length. You could do two fish spines. I run a fish spine and articulated shank just because I have them. Um, and I kind of like the bigger hoop on the articulated shank later. But it's important that you run a fish spine to this, to this trailer hook, the size four A-Rex light stinger. You need a fish spine because this fish spine and the articulated shank this will be hard to show you guys but they have different hoop sizes you see that this is the fish spine small hoop this is the articulated shank big hoop and when you push this mask over make sure my super glue is dry you invert this mask mask magic head same same difference and you thread this hoop in here when i go to flip this back over this small hoop will have uh, it won't touch the inside of this head. That's why we push that head back a little bit from that hook eye with that thread dam, right? That way it can move and articulate. And I'll show you once we get this tied in what I'm talking about. But an articulated shank, the hoop is too big. And it'll physically uh, kind of dampen the action of that head because it'll get in the way, if you know what I'm saying. The, the, the height of the hoop contacts the inside of the disc and so the disc can't deflect to the same degree that it would if it basically didn't have that. So Now this shank, this rear 20 millimeter shank is solely on here for spacing. Now you could just whip finish this right now and super glue it and call it a day. I like to kind of cover it up and I cheat <laughs> and I put wax on my thread because I don't need a super clean dubbing noodle but I'm going to come in with some ice dub and this is the color pearl and I basically am just going to dub a big wad of ice dubbing onto my waxed thread here and I'm not even going to try to build a taper it doesn't need anything fancy it just needs to have ice dub or you can use um, a good substitute would be flash boot dubbing you can take ice wing fiber and just kind of break it to length wing and flash any super thin kind of mylar flash dubbing whatever you fancy and then we're just gonna run that all forward so that's just a shank filler nothing needs to be on the shank whatsoever and the reason why and I've, I've tried to fill these before with stuff and it kind of just ruins it and gets in the way but you want 100 percent kind of no water push in front of this cone and if you fill this with materials it'll kind of fill that cone with material and again it just kind of fills it and it dampens all the action you really want this to be you want this cone to be exposed 100 percent to all the water which is why this has a super thin kind of just tall jerk head if you put a big water push head on here well that's a different reason the head slows down the, the whole principle behind the flies that the tail slows it down and that's what gives it the kick but We'll talk about that at the end because 
if I if I try to talk about it now, this video will be a lifetime. It'll take forever to get to the end. But you can see the difference in the hoop sizes, right? Articulated shank, fish spine. And that fish spine, when you flip this cone back over, if I can, there we go. You can see how much movement that has. <laughs> that was all out of frame. You can see how much movement that has inside of there. If you were to do that with the articulated shank, the hoop is too big and it gets in the way. Now, I'm going to come in here, lock that 20 millimeter articulated shank in place. And again, you could use two fish spines, right? But I wouldn't use two articulated shanks. Now, I've been doing this bug two different ways. Um, you can do either or, I don't really think it matters, but just keep it sparse. The whole point of the bug is sparse, right? Like I just said, you want all the water pressure to hit this cone. If you're pushing water over the cone, it kind of defeats the purpose of having the cone. You want the cone to be what is deflecting and kicking and pulsating and vibrating. So, the first option, and I'll show you both techniques, because um, I'm going to blend them. I'm going to do it different on the front than I am on the shank, but... The first is just chenille. This is UV polar chenille in gold. This is the color UV gold. And it's super light. And what you'll see is the length of the UV polar chenille is basically perfect so that it just like touches the cone, but it's super sparse, right? And you'll see once I get to the front of this shank, obviously when you palmer it up the shank, you get a slight kind of tapered build to it. And so it doesn't all fall into that cone. By the way, I wrap this with a ton of pressure. I will pull so hard, I've actually, I, broke, I break the cord every once in a while. But I was teaching a tutorial, or uh, teaching a, a fly tying class two weeks ago, and I don't know. Just don't be afraid to put a lot of pressure on your materials. And I'll, I'll, I got a, a new video series coming out in about two weeks, maybe next week, probably two weeks, just on how to, to be a better fly tire, and it's all technique based. Um, and I'll go into a whole bunch of that. I digress, I got a little distracted there. But polar chenille, super easy, super light, pushes like no water whatsoever, and it's the perfect length for the shank spacing. And then I'm gonna come in, and I'm just gonna collar this to get uh, the movement of a nice kind of hackle, sloppy feather. We're gonna use the marabou section for the most part. Um, it's just for movement, texture, wobble, and we're just gonna collar that polar chenille, and I want I'm going to tie it in tip first, and I'm actually going to wrap over most of it. So I'm going to come in. You can see I separated my fibers. Here's my tips. I'm going down. I want the webbier fibers here. Cut that off. Expose my stem. I'm going to figure eight my stem again so that I can control the concavity here. You can see my feather sticking 90 degrees out from my shank. And then I'm just going to walk that. Get a nice clean hackle. Get up into some of this marabou style feather. And I actually, this, I know I said schlopping, but this is a Chinese saddle hackle. It's just a more schloppy, webbier piece. And I want that length so that that feather isn't too long. If that feather kind of bleeds over that, that cone, it's going to kind of dampen the action. You just want a, a stiff collar, but you want it to kind of end right about halfway down that rear. You can see my pinky. Just right at the nose of the cone is basically where you want all of this stuff to end for the most part. And that's going to give you the best action. Come in and trap that. And then again, just like that rear marabou fiber, I just wrapped back to where I tied it in so that all of that is 100% trapped, which is just a durability thing. And I don't, I don't know if you caught this in the intro clip where I'm fishing, but I had the most beautiful, <laughs> the most beautiful black over chartreuse, uh, kind of white fly, and I lost it to a pike, and I was super mad because I fished wire leaders like 95% of the time. Like I always fish wire because there's always a chance at a pike. And the coolest thing was is we saw, I'm talking over this because you guys should know how to articulate flies if you've watched my previous videos. But um, 
So the coolest thing, we were sitting there fishing. We're fishing at the spot at the end and uh, sliding a large tungsten cone over a one uh A-Rex Trout Predator series hook. And there was a smallmouth bass, probably 10 inch bass, getting eaten by a northern pike. And he was, he the, the pike had him T-boned and he was pushing him up on the surface broadside to the water, like trying to orient the fish probably head first to swallow him. And no more than five minutes later, I got bit off by a pike. <laughs> and that just seemed completely ironic. Cause you always see pictures of people catching fish and like the fish has a fish in its mouth already or they sometimes they'll even snag the fish in the fish's mouth and I just I tell myself that's what happened so that I can feel good because it was a big old pike it was probably a 40 incher it was a big tank of a pike so I learned my lesson I used to always fish wire the one time I didn't I lost missed a, missed a big opportunity there not doing that again but anyway Sorry for that, I digress, but I lost that fly and I was super mad. It was a good one. So we got our wire here. The wire that I'm using is .024 inch diameter, nylon coated, stainless steel, 49 strand beetle-on, which is a mouthful, but that's what it is. Nice, thick, durable, kind of fat wire. Find the length I want, make sure my loop is vertical and that is perfect got a nice vertical loop on that put a ton of pressure on this get some good cross wraps on that cut that to length and so this distance that my cone uh, my cone head is from my hook eye is relatively important because I like to fit the entire head in front of that cone head. This is a hidden cone head pattern, a hidden tungsten cone head, right? And so you need to be able to fit, if you have an eight millimeter eye, I'm gonna come up here. This is a, a Hedron Flashaboo uh, Mirage, Flashaboo Mirage Dome Eye in eight millimeters. And I just wanna show you guys this. So if you have eyes at home, take an eight millimeter eye, like. Uh, these Hedron eyes, Deer Creek eyes, Flyman eyes, any in that 8 millimeter size range. And just hold that up. See if I can get my fingers out of the way so that you can see that whole eye fits in front of that cone. You see that? Which is ideal because I'm going to try to I'm going to fit this entire head just in front of that cone and I want to keep the head relatively thin so that it doesn't push too much water. So I'm going to seat that cone right where I want it, bring my thread up, build a little dam up in front, lock it behind, and just put some wraps over that cone there. That cone's not going anywhere. And you can see we're gonna get our height and bulk and color contrast and all that good stuff basically from winging back to that, that tail section. And I'm gonna hit all this with super glue real quick. So I was telling you guys there's two techniques I've been do, doing. One is a UV polar chenille, right, which is what we did on the shank. The other one is stacked ripple ice fiber, and, and it replaces the polar chenille. Um, I think it's a little bit more viscous, a little bit more pushy, um, but it's a little bit faster. And so we have this UV polar chenille, and what I'll do is I'll show you the same technique because it's, it, it's, this, it's identical. Um, to what you would do on the shank is what we're gonna do on the hook. So right now, if you have UV polish chenille, go ahead, Palmer UV polish chenille up to this cone head. Um, but if you wanna check out the new Ripple Ice Fiber, I think this makes a really cool flash core. I'm gonna pull quite a bit out. Kinda of want it uh, oriented, so you're gonna to wanna to pinch and pull a little bit, not too much, it's not the end of the world. And then I'm cutting it, just cutting it right in half which is kind of brutal. You just cut it right in half. And then we're gonna V-style it right on top. Flip this over to the bottom. Take the section that I had kind of cut in half here. My other half, I suppose. And V-style that right on the bottom. And then again, if you don't like the length, you just come in, 
and kind of just break it to the right length. But then we're just going to do that one more time. Instead of palmering this from tail to head, you just do two V stacks of ripple ice fiber, which is pretty darn simple. And so when I'm cutting this in half, I'm tapering it. And you're going to lose a little bit of fibers just because you're uh, trying to orient it and then cutting it in half and you had uneven tips and it's not the end of the world. And again, if you're going to do this, aim for sparseness. I think that's uh, really the key to the back hook is, is using that large tungsten cone and then keeping your body just nice and sparse. and wispy so that you get all that water collapse right on that back hook. Now I'm going to come in now that I have this kind of bulkier body up front. Good, super, this is such a cool belly texture. Ripple ice is pretty sweet. And you can see I'm just kind of breaking that. Anytime I find a really long fiber or something that's out of place, I just kind of give it a hard little tug. And we're going to collar this the same way we collared a hot fuzz. So I'm going to come in, and I apologize, this fly is super wicked complex and I use way too many materials, but it's really fun for me to tie like that. <laughs> I think it's so cool and it's so fun. But I'm coming in with a three inch long EP Enrico Puglesi Foxy brush. You can find these at your local shops. This is color root beer. And I'm gonna pin that down and we're gonna collar this the same way we collar our hot fuzz bodies. And I'm gonna use my rotary so that I don't have to change my pinch point up top and trap a whole bunch of stuff down. But I like to do about four tight turns. That's one, two, three, four. Four is about perfect. Clear away your fibers. You want to make sure that you're trapping right on the wire, securing the wire down to the hook shank, not a whole bunch of individual fibers. Kind of print that away, give that a little tug. come up on front. I got just a pile of material everywhere on my desk right now. Try to leave that tag end long and just kind of like figure eight around it, trap that down if you can, and then bring your thread up in front of that cone. So our wing material, keeping with the foxy style, is we're going to wing arctic fox tail hair and that's going to give us our kind of our length, our back, our taper, our color contrast, our counter shading. So you can really just play with that whatever color you have. Um, it's a nice kind of bulky dense wing support with some good guard hairs and it's going to be long enough. You want to use the tail, the tail fibers, right? The tail hair is going to be quite a bit longer. So we're coming in with arctic fox tail hair. This is a color tan. You don't need it super bulky because it retains its shape pretty well in the water. You can do kind of a nice light stack. I'm going to pull up most of the under fibers here with a comb. Just kind of comb out these under fibers. Get that stuff out of there. Find the length that you need. So I like the, the tips. You can see I have these guard hairs, these really long guard hairs, right? And I like those guard hairs because I want you want the internal core, the viscosity, most of the water pushers, you want those all to end basically right at the start, kind of midpoint of that fish spine, right at the nose of that cone. If you can end it everything at the nose of that cone, and then these guard hairs can go a little bit over it because they're light and wispy and they're not gonna push water you'll get that silhouette that you want, but you'll get the action that you want. So it's like a two for one. It's not that important, but that's the taper that I'm looking for when I do this. And then I'm just gonna reverse tie this like Strollis does. Get a nice tight clean bullet on there. Veil the whole top. And this, you can see it textures the whole top, it countershades the entire fly, and it ends right at the head of that cone. So all the water push from this head, which is not a lot because it's a jerk head, but all the water push collapses right onto that cone so you get the maximum tail wiggle. Now this next step is completely optional. I think it adds a lot of texture and tone to the fly, but this reversed ball right here is super prime 
for attaching uh, the pectoral fins. If you want to do grizzly pectoral fins for barring, um, they are they do fall away from the bug a little bit. You can see it has quite a bit of volume to it. And what's cool about it is when you strip that fly, the pec fins collapse, and when it slows down, they fall out again, which is very natural because when a fish swims, they usually tuck their pec fins, and when they slow down and they maneuver, they come out again. So it's a really kind of ultra realistic thing. I don't think it's super like important or make or break it to a fly, but I do think it's a really cool tone. I think it's a really cool way to get barring over just using a marker or something like that. And this is a, a number one hen grizzly saddle from Metz. That's what I'm using. Find the length I want here. Pair these feathers up. So I'm just going to lightly kind of rest these on the side, catch that with a loose wrap, make sure I like the orientation, the length, give that some serious tension and pin that to the side of that fly. And I'm kind of leaving these fibers in. You can see I left the stems, I didn't preen away the stems and it's because I'm trying to kind of confuse the stem orientation. The hen saddles are, are pretty soft. You can kind of make them do what you want. But I find it helps to get the perfect orientation if you just leave uh, the back of those fibers. If you just leave them, you leave the, the, the little fibers on top of that stem because the stems are compressed a little bit. And so it just kind of helps confuse that and rounds it out and traps down more material. So. That's basically the bug. The head is a, a jerk head, a jerk fly head, same as the super jerk, jerk junior, con man, imposter, faux hammer, mega jerk, all that good stuff. And it's just a simple sparse two stack head here. This is laser dub and dark tan. I'm gonna print that out and get the length I need here. And the biggest thing I see with people with these heads is they overdub the head which we already have this arctic fox wing in front of that cone so you can already go pretty sparse and get a decent head but we're just going to do 50 50 on every my video is too long my, my camera doesn't like how long this is taking but silver minnow belly uh, and again sparse top and bottom only um, tying it in 50 50 And the whole purpose behind this is really having a base for our eyes, for our tear mender. Um, and this is, I've found that this is kind of the most durable head I can build, is this dubbing with a tear mender head and eye. It's, it's literally the most durable head. I'm going to do scalp and olive up front, so we're, we're fading from dark tan to scalp and olive. Just a simple little blend stack here. Um, but these heads are crazy, super durable, and you can kind of see in the swimming footage uh, from this fly that that jerk head has a wee bit of motion to it. I mean, this fly is a jig fly. It's intended to be jigged. The weight on it is really kind of heavy, but you still get a little deflection, which I think is cool. And it keeps the head, most importantly, sparse. It keeps the water push down to a minimum uh, so that all of that, that water collapses on that tail. So I have this stack top and bottom, bring my thread through here. I'm gonna half hitch so that I have tension on there for a whip finish. And then I'm gonna comb this out, broke my thread there. Comb this out and I'm gonna saturate this with tear mender and stick my eight millimeter eyes on there. But you guys know how to do that because you've seen all my other videos, so forgive me. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna film that. But basically you hit this with tear mender, you saturate it all the way through, you stick your eyes on there and you let it dry as long as you can. But I'm basically gonna have this dubbing split that pec fin, so I'll just kinda pull it up, pull my pec flint through and then collapse it around that. That way you can see that fin through the dubbing. And then I'm gonna stick my eyes on there. So, thanks for watching. Sorry that took so long. But that's the mic drop, and it's a super complicated bug. But it's super cool. Um, the action is just crazy. So, the really, um, we'll, we'll do the, the typical gunner style 
talking at the end of every video type thing. Cool. Get this up here. So like this fly, right? It's super cool, super slick, super simple. But the biggest thing, like, so I tried to do a sculpted version. I tried to do it with the Sculpt Daddy head, right? And the cool thing, like the Sculpt Daddy heads are designed to push water. If you put a head that pushes water, the bug kind of fails because the whole point is that the tail pushes water. The tail, when the tail pushes water, it dances because it has that big old cone on there. So like, ah, ah, dang. Anyway, so that tail, the whole, the tail has to get 100% boom of the water push and then deflect like crazy. That's the whole point of the tail. And so like, if you do a sculpt inversion and I have, I'm working on a, using a, a Flyman Fishing Company size large sculpt and helmet on a jig hook. You need that mass. You can't put a water push head up front because the front of the fly will slow down and the whole point is that the tail slows the fly down. The tail is what's slowing the fly down, causing that tail to kick like crazy. It's, and it's because it's not, there's a, there's a big difference between water push and water drag, something that's viscous. And it's something I'm trying to figure out. I don't really know how to explain it that well, but the difference is like a wool head versus a strong fuzzy fiber head, right? A wool head slows down, but a strong fuzzy fiber head because it's 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 creating like this this hydraulic dam that all the water has to go around the head is trying to find the pocket of least resistance through the water that's why t-bone heads kind of do this little shimmy shake they do like a belly wobble they just they're trying to find the lowest density pocket that they can fit through because they're pushing water. They don't have drag, right? And so this magic head has zero drag. It's just a plastic cone, right? So that head, it just fills up with pressure and then it's just trying to get rid of the water pressure. But the tail is super light. So when I say, you know, a pushy head versus a pushy tail, don't, don't misinterpret that as a tail that has like a lot of drag. Like if you just put like an infinite amount of materials back here and have a really sparse head, your fly's just going to go in a straight line, like it won't swim. The, the magic head is what's important. A sparse tail, sparse body, all of the water push is being cut by this head and collapsing at the nose of that cone, and then the cone is shedding the water, right? Because it's a push. It's not a drag, it's a push. So it's all important. And I think that tungsten cone is probably the most important thing because the mass has enough momentum when you strip it or when you jerk strip it or when you jig it to overcome the tail. If the tail, if you tie it weightless, the tail is a big parachute and it just stops the fly, which is what I just said, right? If you tie on an infinite amount of materials in the back, your fly will go in a straight line. You'll have this big parachute behind the fly and so the head, it can't, nothing will move, which is why, so yeah, that's, that's the whole point. <clears throat> I just lost my train of thought. but. Mass, 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 right? So if you tie it weightless, this is like a parachute, right? And it'll stop the fly dead in its tracks and it only swims when you pull it. Well, when you have that mass, and it's just like the, the swung fuzz, I said the, the, I use large lead ice because they have enough mass to overcome the, the wiggle tail. So you can strip it and the fly is always, it's always dancing. It's always dancing. And what's cool is because I run it on a floating line, you can get it to do a mostly level retrieve. Like it doesn't like, it's, it's not, it doesn't fall super quick because you're always twitching it. And so it's like, if you want more hang time, I would fish like a super jerk. But this is intended to be a swung fly. It's intended to be swung. It's intended the same uh, situation as a swung fuzz. It's kind of like you got 10 feet of fly line, 10 feet of leader. You're standing on a high bank and you're fishing the main river, swing it out into an inside stream, strip it up the bank. Now it'll fish really well on a jerk strip retrieve. It will. From foot. I think that's, it's, you can play with it. I really like it on foot because what happens is when you fish a river from foot, on foot stationary, your fly moves in two directions. It moves downstream and across stream. You're stripping it across, but it's also moving down. So it has twice the pressure on it that it would normally have. When you fish it from a boat, you move with the fly. So it only moves across. There's only one uh, direction relative to you that the fly is moving. In that situation, fishing from a boat, 
I much prefer super jerks and hollow points and jerk flies in particular. When you fish from foot in fast water and high water, jerk flies do not do good. Jerk flies need that split second moment of slack in order to divert. Because as soon as you touch your fly line and you touch the nose of that fly with tension, they come straight. And so a jerk fly, it needs to be fished from a boat. It needs that single uh, movement relative to you. It needs either slack water or it needs to be fished in a way where you're kind of close enough to the fly that you can create that slack. Because if you fish it in high dirty water with a lot of line, the bow in your line will keep tension on that nose and you'll never get the fly to jerk. That's why I came up with the whole hot fuzz fuzz junior series to begin with is because articulating flies can still get a pulse, they'll slow down with the head and you'll get a tail kick, even on a swing, even with the water pressure, even when they're moving downstream and across stream. That's why I did that, because jerk flies were not meeting that need that I had. I don't know how I get on these topics. What I am so far lost on what I am talking about. But this fly, fishes, that's what it was. Fish is great from a stationary position, either at an anchored boat or fishing from shore, because it's moving across and down simultaneously. So that tail's always kicking. It always has water pressure on it while jigging, while being jerk stripped. It's just the craziest action ever. It's so cool. And it fishes and it makes noise. It vibrates. This wiggle tail is crazy cool for dirty water, for high water, for swung fly. It works good on a jerk strip. It works great on a jerk strip from shore, from that stationary position where it's moving relative to you in two directions, right? When you fish it from a boat and it's just going straight across, it's good, but I'd rather fish a super jerk. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So, sorry for this like 45 minute long video, but it's a really cool fly. So hope you dig it, hope you learn some stuff or whatever. Take it out, play with it, try it, fish it. Have a good one. Bye.